Today we're going to learn about bond polarity, and it relates to a couple other important concepts we've already touched on in class. One of those is the idea of electronegativity, and also something we're going to talk about which is new, the idea of a dipole moment that exists in a molecule. A uh, large number of molecules have these uh, properties, so this is an uh, important topic in chemistry. So first let's look at, well, we want to give a good a definition for the idea of electronegativity. Electronegativity is a relative ability of an atom to attract electrons to itself. Now this applies to atoms that are in molecules, so their atoms are in bonds. So you see in the example here we have two atoms that are bonded, there's a carbon and a fluorine. The one that's more electronegative, which is a fluorine, pulls the electrons more. So the line in between here represents two electrons, that's a shared pair, and the, what happens since that shared pair is pu pulled more by the fluorine and has a partial negative charge. Now, now in ionic compounds we would just write pot, positive or we'd write negative. But in covalent compounds they don't obtain the entire electron or lose the electron. They share the electron so to indicate that it's not as strong of a charge we put the uh, a, a lowercase delta in front of that. Now the lowercase delta is written basically like let's say you write the number 8 and then you stop. So this right here is indicating that's a lowercase delta negative, so a partial negative charge on the fluorine, which means it has more of those electrons. The carbon, which is less electronegative, has a partial positive charge because it does not pull those electrons as strongly. Consequently, the electron cloud is more closely located around the fluorine atom. So electronegativity, let's talk about the trend that's on the periodic table. Uh, well, so why is fluorine the most electronegative atom? So if you look at the periodic table, we see fluorine is easy, easily the most electronegative atom. Now, fluorine's number one, oxygen's number two, and nitrogen's number three. Now, why are those the most electronegative atoms? Well, first, we see that electronegativity increases as you go to the right. Why does that happen? Well, remember, uh, the, the horizontal row is what we call a period. Now the reason it increases as you go across a period is you're adding more protons, so there's a greater nuclear charge. So the reason for the period is it has a greater nuclear charge. Now remember also we talked about before you're also adding electrons, but those electrons aren't what we call shielding electrons. So every proton you add pulls the electrons more. So if, there's a, if you're sharing electrons and you have an atom such as fluorine, it's going to pull those electrons a lot more because it has that great nuclear charge of all those protons in its nucleus. Now there's also a trend we see within a column. So if you look at fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, you see fluorine is by far the most electronegative, and this tri trend holds true for the, peri uh, for the columns or families throughout the periodic table. So why does electronegativity increase as you go up in a family? Well the reason being is really distance from the nucleus. Remember the nucleus has a positive charge, so if you think of the positive charge that's on the nucleus, the electrons, as you go further out, they're going to be further from the nucleus, so there's less of a pull. For example, the fluorine electrons are located, if you remember the location of your periodic table, they're located in the 2s and the 2p orbital. But the, when you get to chlorine, that's 3s and 3p. So they keep getting fur every s and p sublevel is further and further away from the nucleus. Consequently, there's a weaker and weaker charge. So the reason number two, the family reason, is the valence electrons are closer to the nucleus for fluorine, but further away from electrons as you go down, down the family. So also, uh, if you look on your note sheet, there's a little box that says electronegativity difference, and then there's an arrow that points this way. So as electronegativity difference increases, things become more what we call ionic. That means they have a charge, and so they, they get with charges things that they can do things that other particles can't do. Then also we see that there's a arrow going this way. As electronegativity decreases, things become more covalent. So the covalent character increases as you, as you have the lower electronegativity difference. Now you have a table that looks similar to this. I know we put numbers in here. But if it's a perfectly nonpolar covalent bond, there's actually no electronegativity difference. And then if there's a large electronegativity difference, the, the metal actually donates the electron to the nonmetal, and they have charges. So the covalent character increases as you get a smaller electronegative difference, and the ionic character increases as you get a bigger electronegativity ne difference. So 
Well, another term we want to define and discuss is the idea of dipole moment. When a molecule has a center of positive charge and a center of negative charge, we say it has a dipole moment. And this is what we call a permanent dipole. It exists in this molecule all the time. The perfect example of that is water. Now, water, we know, does, dissolves ionic compounds. Ionic compounds have charges. How does it do that? Well, the fact that water has a partial negative end. Now, if you remember back to the previous table, oxygen is actually the second most electronegative element. So it has a very strong pull on those electrons. Thus, our oxygen is partially negative. The hydrogens are partially positive. So there's a bigger electron cloud located around that oxygen. Therefore, it can dissolve a lot of things, such as we think of the ocean as mostly composed of NaCl. And if water wasn't constructed like this, we wouldn't have a, uh, most of our planet wouldn't, wouldn't be comprised of salt water because the salt would not dissolve in there. But luckily, water is polar. So it's able to dissolve not only salt in our water, but ions that uh, are part of the, our nutrition that we take up when we, uh, when we have our food. So it's an important part of our digestive and, our, um, and all the systems in the human body and other organisms as well. Um, so that's, that's a dipole moment. Let's keep going. Uh, so if you take a polar molecule, now how, did the, how are these identified experimentally? Well, one thing is you expose them to something called electric field. Now, if you see, we look at a molecule here that's hydrogen fluoride. Uh, fluoride is, of course, a partially negative. Hydrogen is partially positive. In, in, in diagram A, the electric field is off. So there's no electric field. Notice the molecules are randomly arranged, pointing different directions. But in diagram B, the electric field has turned on. We see the negative field is next to the uh, plate A, and the positive field is next to plate B. On the, on, on the right side, I'm sorry. So what you notice, all the ones with a partial positive charge, all the hydrogens align themselves with the negative pole. And all the positive, at the positive pole, we see the fluorines, which is a partial negative portion, aligns to that pole. So this is one way to uh, experimentally identify polar molecules. And this would be true not only for hydrogen fluoride, but other, other polar molecules as well. So let's continue. Now, let's say, how do you, how, what's the best way to write to indicate something has a partial charge? Well, first, let's look at something that doesn't have a partial charge. You see hydrogen. What is electronegativity difference with hydrogen, or H2? It's actually zero. There's no electronegativity difference with hydrogen. So, the, uh, so it's not polar at all. It's what we call nonpolar. And we'll probably, we're just going to abbreviate, abbreviate that NP as we go through the class or this unit. So this is, this is a nonpolar molecule. It has no dipole. There's no place on it that's permanently negative, even partially or completely. It's always uh, completely, uh, completely no charge. There's no charge anywhere. Now we have polar molecules. We are continuing with the hydrogen fluoride molecule. And there's two ways to represent this. One is you can drew, do a plus sign, which points to the more negative. So the negative uh, or the arrow would point to where you have more electrons. And this positive part would indicate where you have the partial positive charge. Now notice we put a partial negative charge next to the fluorine and a partial positive charge next to the hydrogen. Now if you were to write this next to the molecule, you would just go H and then you connect it with the shared pair fluorine and then you do partial negative next to that and then partial positive next to hydrogen. Now the other way to do that would just to be to write a hydrogen and then connect it with a bond of fluorine and then just do a line with an arrow. The arrow ends at the more electronegative side, the sorry, that has a partial negative charge, and then your positive is there. So that's it. Uh, that's how you, that's uh, a little summary of bond polarity, electronegativity, and dipole moments. Thanks.